the ontological argument. This argument, unlike the design argument that we looked at, uses deductive reasoning. And that is that if you accept the premises of the proof to be true, then the conclusion is necessarily true. So let's take a look at one example. If you argue that red meat has iron in it, which is premise one, and then it leads us to a second claim, which is that beef is red meat, it would follow if those two premises are believed to be true, then this conclusion is necessarily true, that therefore beef has iron in it. But things aren't always what they seem. It is possible to have an invalid deductive argument. Take this one for example. If you put forward the premise that all swans are white, and then you put Jane in the mix in the next premise and say Jane is white, you're following, if both premises are believed to be true then, that Jane is a swan. Well, Jane might be a swan if you've named a swan Jane, but if we're talking about the mammal, a human Jane, just because the colour of her skin might be considered white, that wouldn't necessarily follow, therefore, that she is a swan. And that would be an invalid deductive proof. And so your job is to evaluate the ontological argument to decide whether it's a strength being a deductive proof. It is also a proof that uses a priori knowledge. And so unlike the design argument and the cosmological argument, which we previously looked at using a posteriori knowledge, this proof uses a priori knowledge because it's a form of reasoning that is independent of experience. In fact, it uses reason alone. One example, is 1 plus 1 equals 2. This is also known as a tautology. By definition, it must be true. And when we go to look at the ontological arguments now, you will see that the crux of the argument, especially with Anselm in his first ontological argument, makes it very clear that he believes the definition of God alone is sufficient enough to prove his existence. So let's have a look at Anselm. Anselm's ontological argument, it was he who first put forward an ontological argument of this kind. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury in the UK. Using deductive reasoning that we've just made reference to, he sets out two premises which, if true, make the conclusion logically necessary. Like we said, the conclusion must therefore follow to be logical and necessary. True. So his argument in its basic form, premise one, is that God is the greatest conceivable being, or the GCB. In Latin, in intellectu, this is the idea that God is the greatest being you can possibly think of in your mind. Premise two, to be the greatest conceivable being, God must also exist in reality, in Latin, in re, not just in the mind. And therefore the conclusion clearly follows, he argues God exists. And Anselm is using a priori reasoning here, remember. Knowledge that is independent of his experience, basing it on definition alone. There are two parts to Anselm's argument. And so furthermore, he also points out that he believes God is necessary. And that's because he's not contingent. He's not dependent 
on anything else. And therefore, he must have necessary existence, aseity. And then we come to Ganilu's response to Anselm, and he chooses to use Anselm's own logic against him. Ganilu, a monk who believed in God, but he didn't believe that Anselm did justice to talking about God. And so what he does is he applies Anselm's logic to lots of other things to try and show how ridiculous and absurd his argument actually is. Reductio ad absurdum. One of the things that he likens it to is this perfect island, this lost island. And what Ganilo does is he tries to claim that what Anselm has done is be able to think anything and imagine anything into existence. Leprechauns, unicorns, you name it. And here with the perfect island or the lost island, he refers to it as an island more excellent than any other islands. It didn't take long for Anselm to swiftly reply to Gunnilo to point out to him that he hadn't used the same phraseology as Anselm and in doing so he hasn't really got the same argument that Anselm put forward. In fact Anselm feels that Gunnilo has simply missed the point of his argument. He doesn't use and match the same phrasing, than which a greater cannot be conceived. This can be conceived notion doesn't exist in Ganilo's perfect island. In fact, Ganilo just merely says that the island is more excellent than any other lands. Greater than everything just doesn't have the same impact as a being than which a greater cannot be conceived. A bit later on, Alvin Plantinga also highlighted a major criticism and flaw with Ganello's point in pointing out simply that a perfect island or this lost island simply cannot be compared to a being like God. It's not a like-for-like -like comparison. Well, let's look at the next ontological argument that came along. René Descartes. He set forward his ontological argument in his work's fifth meditation. It goes something like this. Premise one, God is perfect. Premise two, existence is perfection. The conclusion, therefore God exists. God for Descartes is a supremely perfect being. What he's saying here in the second premise is that it is more perfect to exist than not to exist. Existence is a perfection. He also uses the term essence to mean something fundamental to what something really is. And the analogy of the triangle is used by Descartes pointing out that a triangle has three angles, and these are part of the essence of what make up a triangle, in the same way that existence is fundamental to God and his essence. Well, a bit later on, Immanuel Kant criticised Anselm and Descartes for both arguing that existence is a predicate. He rejects the argument that existence can be a predicate. A predicate is an attribute or a quality of something. So you might say, the shirt is blue. Knowing the shirt is now blue tells you something new, something more about the shirt that perhaps you didn't know before. But what Kant argues is that existence tells you nothing more at all about God. It adds nothing new. Knowing something exists tells us nothing about the thing itself. He also argued that non-existence of God is also something you could conceive of. Further down the line, Bertrand Russell, who at the time was pretty 
famous for dismantling the ontological argument, uh, which is the reason why, if you look at his radio debate with Copleston, and you can click on the link to see that lengthy, detailed analysis of the famous radio debate, um, he wants to steer the conversation with Copleston towards the ontological argument, because at the time, Russell was famous for, for being the, the one who knew how to dismantle it with his criticisms that he'd built uh, further upon from Immanuel Kant. So building upon Kant's criticism, Russell argues that things should only be described as existing if we can see that they do in fact exist in the world. And since we can't see God existing in the world with our own eyes, it's not something we should really be ascribing to him. He actually thinks that all ontological arguments are a case of bad grammar, that they've made a linguistic mistake without realising it. And in fact, they only appear to be proving God's existence in the end. One of the criticisms uh, landing against Descartes is that he made it sound very good and solid, his analytic argument for God. But in fact, a lot of it was just simply wordplay. There's also David Hume and his criticism of the ontological argument. He argues that the notion of necessity has no meaning whatsoever. And even if we did entertain the idea that there was meaning to the term necessity, why just God? We know that Hume has precedent here in talking in the, in the cosmological argument when um, critiquing Aquinas, that he makes the case for questioning, does it have to be the God of classical theism? Why God at all? He also says that other things could also be considered necessary. Norman Malcolm, much later on, offered a revised ontological argument. And he says that there are three options. The first is to believe that God is necessary. The second is to believe that God doesn't exist. And the third is to believe that God is contingent, dependent on something else to exist. So he rejects contingency. And he rejects the second option because he says it is conceivable to think of a God who doesn't exist. Therefore, his conclusion is that God is necessary and he does exist. In fact, he makes it clear that God is logically necessary. Now, this is a type of modal argument and Alvin Plantinga criticised Malcolm's modal ontological argument and wanted to strengthen it further. And he did that by introducing maximal excellence and maximal greatness in particular. Now, let's just be clear about something first. What is a modal argument? Well, a modal argument is to say that 1 plus 1 equals 2 is necessarily true, or that a square circle can't exist, would be a modal claim. Because it depends on claims about possibility, necessity, and impossibility. That's why with Malcolm's argument, you hear phrases like logically possible, logically impossible. And with Plantinga's premises that you're about to read, you see the language of possibility. So in the first premise, there is a possible world in which there is an entity which is maximally great. So when applying modal logic to an ontological argument, 
you end up invoking possibility or necessity about God and his existence. What you're doing is you're defining God in a way that shows that he exists necessarily if he exists at all. Obviously, the conclusion from the proponent is that he, in fact, does exist necessarily. It's a very clever argument on the one hand, because most atheists wouldn't even be forced to have to agree to it tautologically. They would simply accept the premise that it's at least possible for God to exist as a concept. And so a modal argument is far superior to the traditional classic ontological arguments that we've looked at with Anselm and Descartes. And that's because they point out that God could have existed rather than existence being a predicate of God. So the rest of his argument Premise two, a maximally great being would exist in all possible worlds. Therefore, this maximally great being exists in this world. The emphasis here from Plantinga to strengthen Malcolm's argument is in the third part of his proof, the conclusion, that the maximally great being exists in this world which is something that Malcolm doesn't emphasise. And that is an overview of the ontological argument.